my name is Armando Losa. I'm with Hub Cities Consortium. We are a workforce development center here in the city of Huntington Park. Um, I am a resident of uh, Maywood, and I've been in the area for about all my life. <laughs> and so um, I'd like to introduce the United Way Student Fellows. Hi everyone, um, I am Gabriela Ballesteros, I'm a 12th grader at International Studies Learning Center and um, I'm a student fellow from United Way. Um, this forum means a lot to me because even though um, I'm a senior and I'll be graduating soon, um, I still have a younger sister who will be affected by you know, the winning candidate. So it's really significant to be here today in order to learn about the candidates who will be affecting your child's future and how your vote will affect thousands of students. Hi everyone, my name is Candice Montenegro. I'm also a senior at uh, International Studies Learning Center. And I'm here because a lot of graduates at my school, they're graduating knowing that they won't be able to go to a four-year college. So I know the candidates here will be able to make uh, changes that will be able to help them be ready and uh, college ready and be able to get into a four-year college. Um, tonight we're here to listen to the candidates speak on important um, issues that will affect over 650,000 students along with the seven um, billion dollar budget. It's important that we as community members are here to listen to them and understand the issues at hand so that um, we can be able to be informed that will be, uh, these decisions will be affecting uh, students now and students in the future. I want to introduce our moderator, Dr. Manuel Pastor. He's the Professor of Sociology and American Studies and Ethnicity at USC. Thank you, glad to be with you. And let's give those young leaders another big round of applause. We're hoping that this kind of a forum and these kind of uh, this kind of education system produces more such leaders. Déjame empezar diciendo que en español que si hay personas que necesitan traducción, que yo creo que hay máquinas, sí, que están afuera, sí. There's, que están máquinas allí, sí. Una persona necesita traducción, levanta la mano y voy a decir esto otra vez en como 15 minutos para la gente que llega tarde. So we want to thank you for uh, uh, being here tonight. Uh, this. Uh, is really an example of it takes a village because when you see the number of uh, hosts I need to read off, it's almost the same as the number of people uh, in the room. It's pretty incredible. So the co-host for this event, it's obviously uh, sponsored in part by United Way, but Inner City Struggle, Public Council Law Center, Children's Defense Fund, California Community Foundation, KIPP Los Angeles, Arts for LA, the Los Angeles Educational Partnership, Coral Fellows, uh, the uh, Communities uh, for Los Angeles Student Success class, Chirla, let's give Chirla a big hand, Woo. Uh, Educators for Excellence, and then uh, supporting us here, the Old Timers Foundation, uh, DJ Meno Min, uh, Gabriel and team will be doing the videography, Tamea with photography, LAUSD is providing translation, Media Image PR, SEIU Sola, Local 2006 on security in the LA City Registrar's Office. Let's give all of those co-hosts and vendor a big round of applause. So I'm going to read the guidelines for today, but let me go ahead and ask our uh, two candidates to come up, Andrew Thomas and Ref Rodriguez. Let's give them a big round of applause. There's actually three candidates, as many of you know, for this position, but there's only two chairs being filled tonight by these candidates. Um, so I'll say a word about them in just a second, but before I do, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, order of what we'll be doing tonight and what the rules are. Um, we will uh, begin with the candidates making two-minute uh, speeches each. I believe that there's supposed to be a timekeeper there that will be helping? Okay, great. Um, and after that, I will be asking a series of questions. They'll give in-depth answers of one minute each. Uh, 
which will be hard to do, I'm sure. And then we will open it up to the audience, not for you to ask questions directly. There'll be a thing at the end where you'll be able to do that. But if you'll be able to uh, submit cards, and those cards will be collected by a volunteer, I'll sort through them and uh, ask those questions. Uh, we do ask you, when you're asking a question, to first, uh, in your written statement, make sure it's actually a question. Uh, second, if it's a sort of personal attack on a candidate who's here or a candidate who's not here, that is not a question that we will ask. Uh, we're really trying to get at the substantive issues. Because of the time constraints, not every question will be posed to the candidates. Uh, but uh, there will be a little bit of uh, time at the end. Verbal, direct verbal interaction between the audience and the candidates during the forum uh, is not what we'll be doing. Uh, but what we will do is we will be ending this uh, formal session at 7.45, and that'll give you some one-on-one -on -one time with the candidates. There's another bottle up here. Uh, thank you. That will give you some uh, f uh, informal time with the candidates to do one-on-ones afterwards. Um, I'll say just a word about who they are. I want you to understand something, though. It takes tremendous courage. It takes tremendous commitment. It takes tremendous energy for anyone to run for public office, to put their name, their soul, their full self, particularly in a contest that's about doing the best thing we can for our children, that's really a courageous and honorable thing. Not anyone, not, ever, not all of us have the stamina to do it, to go to all of these forums. Not all of us have the courage to take these positions. Uh, so both of these candidates that are with us today really represent the best that we have to offer in Los Angeles in terms of really stepping up to the plate for responsibility. I'm gonna introduce them uh, first, Andrew Thomas. Andrew Thomas is an educator, an educational data consultant. Uh, he's a pretty active member of the community, having co-founded the Silver Lake Independent JCC and serving on the school site councils at Franklin Elementary, uh, King Middle School, and Marshall High. Uh, he's earned a bachelor's degree from Columbia University and a PhD in urban schooling from UCLA, that other university here in Los Angeles, uh, but will be be kind to you nonetheless. So uh, let's give Andrew Thomas a round of applause. And then we will be hearing next, we'll go in this order and at the end, by the way, we'll reverse. So Andrew will start with the two minute, uh, Ref, you'll be second, but at the end, you'll be the first person uh, giving the closing. Uh, uh, Ref Rodriguez is uh, the son of immigrants from Jalisco, Jalisco Mexico. Uh, he grew up in Cypress Park and has made tremendous progress. I think he lives about a mile now from where he grew up. Uh, but he's made tremendous, uh, uh, that shows a lot of commitment, but he's also made tremendous professional uh, progress, recognizing that parents deserve more and better school options for their children. Uh, Ref opened the first of several public schools in his neighborhood under the banner Partnerships to Uplift Communities, uh, and he's gone on to uh, do more. He now lectures at Loyola Marymount's University School of Education and was appointed by Governor Brown to serve on the California Commission for Teacher Credentialing. Let's give Ref Rodriguez a big round of applause as well. So um, you're each going to begin with two minutes, and I will be enforcing the, you'll see the signs there. Let me tell you something that we will do uh, to make sure that you stay on time. As you're getting close to uh, the time up, the timekeeper will let you know. Uh, and if you go over the time, uh, I will raise both my hands. And that will be a sign to the audience to thunderously applaud whatever point you were making, because surely it was your last. Uh, <laughs> So those will be the rules, we'll enforce them. So we're gonna start with a two minute sort of statement about essentially why you're here, why you're running from Andrew Thomas. Okay. Thank you, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you Dr. Pastor and all the people who sponsored this event and thank you all for coming out tonight on a Tuesday night. Uh, it's great to see young people in the audience, especially very young people. I think we have some very young people here today. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Thomas and uh, I'm, like uh, Dr. Pastor said, I, I'm a parent. My kids go to the local neighborhood schools over in Silver Lake, and they're currently 
uh, a junior and a freshman at Marshall High School. And I'm also an education professional. As you mentioned, I have a PhD in education from UCLA. And I do research and evaluation projects all over the state. Uh, but in particular, I've been very active in uh, Pico Union area, where I, was, uh, where I was there at the beginning of the Belmont Zone of Choice in creating the first pilot schools. I've also worked extensively at Fremont High School, which is not too far from here. I've worked in Inglewood, I've worked in Downey, so I've, I've done a lot of work in the schools in the area. Uh, I'm really running because uh, I probably agree with most of you here that the LA schools aren't good enough, that we have some fundamental problems. When 30% of the kids uh, are not on track to graduate and more in some schools, then we haven't done enough. Um, and uh, when my friend's daughter comes home and says that she's marked truant, because uh, there was too long of a line to the girls' bathroom and the bathroom was closed, I think that we have problems with the schools. And I think that the problems come back to the board. The board makes decisions like buying iPads rather than fixing bathrooms because it's got a fundamental issue with the actual people on the board and I think putting new people on the board is the answer. Uh, and in particular, I think we need more professionalism on the board and even more than that, we need an independent voice on the board, somebody who comes from the community, somebody who has kids in the schools, and somebody who hears about these policies that are made every day at the kitchen table when their kids come home. So if your interest is high quality schools for your kids and you think the independent voice is the way to achieve that, then I'm your candidate and I hope to earn your vote tonight. Thank you. Um, Ref, and, uh, let's uh, uh, skip the applause so we can maximize the time that we're talking, unless they say something particularly brilliant. Uh, but Ref, uh, don't worry, Andrew, that was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Ralph, why don't you take your two minutes to kind of introduce yourself to the group. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Gracias por venir esta tarde. Me da mucho gusto estar en la ciudad de Huntington Park, estar con ustedes. I'm really pleased to be here in Huntington Park to be with you today. Um, I know it's difficult to get out of home to be part civically, but I'm so proud that you are here uh, and that your voice will be heard. I'm doing this because of, people, of young people like Candace and Gabriela, who just stood before us. Candace and Gabriela shouldn't be the exception, they should be the norm. Our young people are brilliant beyond measure, and our schools don't treat them that way, especially our schools in the Southeast cities. I've been coming to the Southeast cities over the last few weeks, and I've been learning so much about the needs here. And what I realize more than anything is the power and potential that you have as a community to uplift your schools. And what I also realize is that the person who's, who's sitting there now is not doing anything for you. In fact, he is a barrier to the progress of your children and the progress of this community. And so I'm running because I believe that I can make a difference. And the difference that I will make comes from deep experience, 20 years as a teacher and administrator. I founded a school, founded 15 schools, and those schools are schools of excellence, serving predominantly Latino kids. Those schools graduate kids at the rate of 95%, and 90% of the 95% go on to college. So it will be my pleasure and my honor to serve this community as your next school board member. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now, now we have to make sure to give Andrew his round of applause too. So, uh, so let me, uh, um, uh, before we get started, I believe there's comment cards that our uh, people have been given or can... Okay, great. So if you fill out a question, uh, just raise your hand and somebody will come up and pick it up. Um, but for the next few minutes, I'll be the one asking uh, the questions. And the first questions I'll start with are based on the ones you've already answered in the questionnaire. But they'll be a little bit different, okay? Um, so let me start uh, with Ref who just spoke. Um, it's the end you win. It's the end of your first year in office. What are you the most proud of accomplishing in year one? First and foremost, I want to make sure that I'm a part of moving that governing board towards actually governing. I see the governing board currently as polarized, and I'd like to be a force within that board to bring it together to move the work forward so that all our kids can achieve. I have a focus on middle schools. We know our kids physically drop out in high school, but it's in middle schools where our kids start to drop out emotionally and mentally. And, and that's a place where the district is not focused on just yet. And so I wanna make sure that we focus on middle schools. Our kids deserve better education in those areas. I also wanna make sure that our parents are, feel like invested partners. And real partnership is between equals, the institution, 
that is supposed to serve our families, but also the families. And that we're learning from families about their needs and about how to educate their children, because they are the primary educators of their kids. And that we are listening and learning from them, but also working, encouraging, and educating them to navigate a system that is set up to, um, to not have their kids succeed. Thank you. Um, Andrew, you get elected. That's the end of your first year in office. What are you the proudest of having accomplished? I think uh, the one thing that I'll be proudest of if I've accomplished it is creating a new connection between the school board members office and the community. So I will really be focused on the individual schools in the community so that the, the after school program, the, the dropout prevention program that they're trying to build at Franklin High is in place and running so that Jefferson High School is is running smoothly this year as opposed to last year so that Bell High School continues to be great um, and the new high schools continue to grow and thrive and, uh, and I'll, I'll be doing that by creating new connections between the school board members office and the individual schools and hopefully turning the school board around so that it really focuses on the schools and starts to make policies that help schools rather than just uh, our regulations for schools to comply to. So if, that, if I were to say one general thing, that's what I would say. Great, thank you. Um, one concern in this particular district has to do with uh, students facing different kinds of disadvantages, economically, uh, sometimes environmentally even. Um, what steps would you take as a board member to ensure the equitable distribution of the local control funding formula dollars to make sure that they go to the students who need it? We'll start here with Andrew. Uh, I, I've been involved in, in trying to get the local control funding formula dollars more focused on high needs communities as a member of the parent advisory committee. Uh, I'm, I've become a big fan of something from the advancement project called the aggregate needs index which prioritizes the highest needs schools in the district and I would like to turn the board around to, to focus on those schools. The very highest is Fremont High but there are several schools here in the southeast that also have the high needs. So right now, we do focus with the local control funding formula dollars on low-income students, English language learners, and foster youth. Um, I would like to also focus on particular neighborhoods and particular schools with that money. Uh, Ref, what would you uh, do to ensure an equitable distribution of the uh, LCFF dollars, uh, the local control funding formula dollars? To me, that question shouldn't even exist. The, fa the money belongs to the kids, and the money should follow the, the students. And therefore, if we just simplify it that way and say, and use weighted formula to ensure that kid in that community, this is the amount that's based on the state uh, funding level, and that whole amount must come to the kid and to the school. That doesn't happen now. That's why you talk about equitable distribution. Equity is giving every kid what he or she needs, and that's different across our communities. But the real simplistic way to solve this is by making sure the dollars follow the student. And then giving the authority locally to this, the principals, teachers, the community, and the families to spend and allocate those resources to help those kids. Great. That leads to uh, a follow-up uh, to you that will actually go to Andrew as well. So you're saying that the dollars don't fully follow the students. Right. What stands in the way, and then how do you enhance parent participation? Yeah, so first of all, it does not follow the students. In fact, in our communities, our communities that have desperate need, we have the youngest teachers, uh, the, the teachers with the least amount of experience, and yet the dollars that are supposed to be going to the kids in that community go to pay to teachers in the West Valley or somewhere else in the district because those teachers have much more seniority and longevity. So while our kids get the least experienced teachers, they also get the least amount of dollars. Those dollars end up going to labor costs in other parts of our community. When the money follows the kid, then that school and that community can get the best teachers for those students. And that just, it's that simple, actually. It's not complicated. And the parent engagement piece? Yes, sir. So part of it is also then, as we're identifying in the schools what the needs are, we're connecting with families and understanding what are those needs specifically to this community and making sure that there is an exchange of communication between families and communities and the, and the school and the administration to put those resources into those areas that are mo of most need. Uh, Andrew, same question. In your experience and then both as a parent and sort of looking at this as a system, what stands in the way of getting the dollars to the students and what's the role of uh, parent participation? Well, uh, 
we, we may disagree a little bit on this. I think that the district is right now pushing for, but it doesn't exist, something called an unduplicated count, which is so now if a kid is, is designated low income and an English language learner, they only get one piece of money. You know, one, they're counted once. Uh, but the, what the district is pushing for is to count them twice to get extra money to those kids who have additional needs. So I, I support, obviously, some kids are, the way we talk about it is they're more expensive to educate because there are more challenges to overcome. Um, uh, yeah, so the district is pushing for that. I don't think the school board member knows that the district is pushing for that. But as a, a school board member, I would encourage that move in that direction. Um, yeah, so that, that, but the other thing to say about that is that place does matter. There are schools uh, where there's a concentration of high need, and it's very important to, to, to recognize that that compounds the issue. So it's not just that there are uh, 600 kids who, who qualify for free and reduced lunch. If there are no kids who don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, then you have an additional problem. But if you have a, a school that has a little bit of each, then it's a little easier. Great. Um, so let me... Uh shift directions a little bit. Uh, I was talking with a reporter actually before, and of course one uh, challenge that uh, low-income communities, immigrant communities face, is that often there aren't computers in the household, uh, what used to be called the digital divide, but it still exists. Uh, particularly given the recent experience with iPads in the schools, uh, what's the role of technology, and how can the district roll out technology in a way that actually meets the needs of children. Again, I'm gonna start with the person just answered, Andrew, and then go to Rev. Uh, first of all, and I think we probably agree on this, is, is that I'm against using, and I have a long history of, of experience with educational technology, I'm against using whiz-bang, you know, fancy technology in the classroom. Uh, what we do in the classroom, we, you know, teaching literacy skills, problem solving skills, critical thinking, can be done with some of the basic tools. And I'm a fan of, of the, the most popular thing that's happened in the classroom in basically my lifetime is a digital overhead projector. The, we use Elmo's at our high school. And that's a lot less expensive than laptops, and it's, uh, it's a great product. Also, um, graphing calculators are less expensive than laptops, and they really have an instructional purpose. But the point is, you have to know what you're trying to teach first and what you're trying to accomplish, and then have technology that works as a tool to accomplish that. Don't put the technology first. Put the uh, instruction first. And there's, there's one other quick thing that, that is useful it, is, uh, is, is connectivity for parents at home should be a priority. And I'm, I've become a fan of something called MiFi, which is something that we can do with um, community partnerships and schools working together. Uh, Rev, to you, what is the proper role for technology in the schools? How can it be rolled out in a way that closes the digital divide and makes sense? Yeah, so the technology is a tool, and the tool is only useful if the people that are using it know how. Um, and then secondly, the tool is only useful if the people that are using it choose the tool because they know and understand the context. And so I do believe that we need to get technology to the classrooms because, especially in communities like these where the technology doesn't exist at home and the libraries are not open uh, enough hours and there are not enough computers in the community to be able to meet the needs of, our, of the kids here. But what's really important is to make sure that our teachers are supported and trained in the use of those tools and that the staff is able to do that as well, and then that the parents are engaged in, in that process as well. Because one thing about parents is that if their young people, or their children, know more about technology than they do, there's an apprehension around, what is my child doing in technology? And schools have a role here about educating families about how to ensure their kids are being safe in, in the use of technology. Mm -hmm. So it all comes really back down to, it's a tool, teachers need support to in, use that tool, and families need to be engaged. Right. That thing about the young really resonates because today I handed my cell phone to a young person saying, can you please figure out how this works, right? So, <laughs> That's right. Um, so this is an appropriate uh, question. We might do a couple on this. Uh, start with Ref. Uh, what's the proper role for charters in the district? So I come back to, to two things. One is that charters were, were, by legislative mandate, were supposed to do two things. One is to close the achievement gap for kids and serve those kids that need them most. And I think that our charters in Los Angeles are doing that. Secondly, they're supposed to be vehicles of innovation that would then take those uh, innovative practices and take them back to the district. And I think that the district has not been responsive in leveraging the assets that exist in a charter school and the practices to transform uh, district schools. And I think in some ways the charter community has not been as um, receptive in pushing that out too. 
So I believe that we need to close schools that are not performing, that's the law. But I also think that there's room for us to expand those schools that are. There needs to be a quality school in every single corner, in every community, and I don't care if it's charter, district run, magnet, it just needs to be quality and it needs to serve kids well. And Andrew, Andrew, to you the question, what's the proper role of charters in the LA Unified School District? That's a great question. I like the way that's worded rather than, are you for or against charters? Yeah, or <laughs> do you want more or less, right? What's the proper role? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that, ch that, that we have a challenge right now with integrating charters I into the system. There, there, there's a danger of having, uh, possibly having too many charters, and there are people within the charter school movement who would like to see a city full of charters. And uh, that's very threatening to, to regular public teachers and, 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 and families in schools. Uh, but on the other hand, there's like lots of great innovation and some of the best work is being done by charter schools. So I would promote any kinds of ways that we can integrate the two systems together. Definitely, we should have transparency in terms of the data systems between the two schools so that I can look at the data of, uh, of all the regular public schools and all the charter schools and compare them. And I think that would benefit both sides. And um, we should have transparency in terms of it, admissions as well. Uh, and then another thing to point out about charters, which is a, is a concern, well, there are two concerns. One is the unionization of teachers in charters. And an, another is the amount of money they take away from the district. And I think we can, you can plan for you that. Can, you can stop because actually the next question I was going oh, to say, follow up is, uh, <laughs> What do you see as the downside of charters, the thing that even if you're in favor of them, you say this is something we really need to be concerned about, accountability or some mm -hmm. other issue? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not as concerned about accountability. Uh, I think charters have quite a bit of accountability, and I, and I like the autonomy part of charters quite a lot, and I push that kind of autonomy in the pilot schools I've worked with. Uh, but I think we do need to recognize that there are some legitimate concerns that people have with charters, and, and one of them is the fiscal impact that they have on the bottom line of the district. Every time a new charter opens, it takes money away from the bottom line budget of the district. And so we should plan for that by when new charters open, um, having them open at the beginning of the year so that we can plan for the entire budget of the year. I think that's something we can do within the law. And again, we're very concerned about equity and transparency with charters as well. Thank you. Uh, Ref, as somebody who's started schools, what's the, looking at it from a system point of view, what's the big concern that you would, you would make sure gets addressed that you would pay attention to? You see, I, I see this pretty black and white. This is about families and choice. If you have a family and you live in a neighborhood where there aren't good options and there's a charter school there, that's where you're going to go. And that, I am here for my children, I'm going to put them in the best school possible. And when those options are, are not there, that's a problem and that's a systemic thing. So for me, it's all about the quality of schools and parents having the choice. What, as a board member, my focus really needs to be about improving district schools, right? And making sure that there are viable options for our kids. There's no real choice unless it's between two equally excellent things. And right now what we've got is excellence and mediocrity. And our kids deserve excellence. And so I believe... <laughs> that it's just a bunch of adults who can't see this from the child's perspective and the desperation in families around giving their kids a leg up on life. And we've got to get over that and we've got to start focusing on our kids and our communities. Um, so uh, one uh, issue that we know that's important for uh, the academic performance of students is the quality of the teaching uh, that they're receiving. What can LAUSD do to attract and retain the best talent and make sure that that best talent is also being deployed in the most challenging schools? So 15 years ago when I started my first charter school, the only thing that I was focused on is making sure that the four teachers I was hiring were going to be the best teachers for our kids. So I've had lots of experience with this. And the truth is that there are two big things that um, we can do as a system to ensure we attract and retain high quality teachers. And that is one, make sure that we, when we bring them into the system, we support them. And we give them high quality professional development. And we ensure that their growth and that they're seeing growth in their kids and we're giving them the resources and the work conditions that are 
uh, that, that are merited by a professional. And then secondly, is to have a career pathway for them, is a place where they can see themselves, I can be here 10 years, and yet that means I'm gonna be doing and having different impact in my school. I could become a trainer of trainers. I, become, I can become a coach, a mentor teacher. I can, I can use my skill set to impact more kids, and yet I can still be in the classroom, maybe as a demonstration classroom. So we've gotta give our teachers much more leadership opportunities without pulling them away from the classroom. Great, I'm gonna take a little bit of privilege here, give you 30 additional seconds, and then I'll give you a minute and a half, uh, because of what I wanted, how do you get the best teachers in the most challenging schools? So one of the things that, um, as a commissioner for teaching credentialing, we talk about this all the time, about how we, we bring that talent to California or how we cultivate it. And the truth of the matter is we've got to incentivize them. And the incentive is not necessarily just financial. It's about working conditions. It's about making decisions around curriculum and instruction. It's about giving, being given power, authority, and voice as the professional in that classroom. It's not about being told what to do, it's about engaging in dialogue about what are the best practices for kids. Our teachers want to serve and help kids, and we need to let them do that. Great, okay, okay. so that third, okay. <laughs> I, I hope it's okay with you guys that I'm being flexible and sort of shifting things up to get more of a conversation. Uh, so you get a minute and a half, and the question was uh, about how do we attract and retain the best teacher talent in the district, and how do we make sure that that talent is delivered to the most challenging schools? Yeah, I'll just really build on, on what Ref said already. Uh, the, uh, the ultimate reward for a teacher is seeing the child's eyes light up when they understand something. It's the, it's the reason any of us teach. And uh, the reason teachers get discouraged is when things get in the way of that. They have too many rules to follow, they feel that they can't succeed. They're not making enough decisions, they're not listened to, they don't feel respected. So I think the thing, you know, what we have to do is have schools where teachers are respected and they're respected by having decision-making power about their own teaching so that when they see a, a child with a problem and they've diagnosed the problem and they know what they want to do, they're able to do it. They're not stifled by the system. So that's the, the bottom line is having teachers who are, are decision makers who feel invested in the schools and, and who have the support from the principals. I guess that's one thing that we haven't said yet. We need principals who evaluate teachers fairly in a, in a supportive way. And we need a whole district that really treats teachers as the most important people we have. I mean, administrators are important as well, counselors are important, but teachers are the frontline employees for the district, and the whole district should be structured to support those teachers. It should be, it should be, it should be, Everything should be about the teachers. Is basically, and then teachers teachers will feel that, and they'll and and they'll get the rewards that they that would naturally come to them from being in high functioning schools where the conditions for learning are 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 good. And you can do that in the in any schools in any neighborhood. Great, thank you. Um, so, one of the things that research seems to indicate is that uh, if folks don't achieve reading at third grade, uh, there's real problematic trajectories moving forward. Uh, what would you do to put all hands on deck in making sure that we're getting students reading in third grade at grade level? We'll start with Andrew. Yeah, it's really about putting all, all hands on deck. I, I've seen figures as high for, for this community as 80% of, of the children are not reading at grade level or proficient level by fourth grade. And uh, it's, it's a project that we have to begin with transitional kindergarten all the way through third grade with a lot of focus on literacy for those kids. And uh, the, the good news is that the, the district actually has focused on that. It needs to continue to focus. Transitional kindergarten is relatively new. And LAUSD is very late compared to other districts around the country uh, in adopting something called response to intervention, which is a very effective way to figure out exactly which areas of literacy need growth and to work with particular kids who need help in that area and to assess them, give them formative assessment as you go along. And uh, so we need to beef that up and continue moving in that direction. We need to bring that 80% uh, not proficient level way, way, way down. And we, and we can do it quickly if we focus on it. Uh, Ref, what would you do to address this third grade reading challenge? Yeah, so we've got to start early. And that means that we're doing amazing work um, in our, the early grades. But I think one of the things that our board members don't seem to do a whole lot of is lobbying Sacramento 
um, and being part of the political process to ensure that we do things like universal pre-K. Right? It's a shame that we do not have that in California, and it's a big barrier to why we're not getting to the places that we need to, especially with our third grade reading scores, and it's something that we can do. But the other piece is really about preparing our teachers and making sure that there's literacy across the curriculum, that kids are reading, writing, listening, speaking all day long, that our families are engaged in that literacy, because language and literacy is critical and it doesn't matter what language it is. So even our families who are, who are uh, Spanish speaking or foreign language speaking, their speaking to their kids every single day is an important thing that does boost literacy levels for our, our young people, for our children. And it's about educating the community about how we can all support literacy for all of our kids. It's coming together and it's making a difference for our kids. Great, thanks. And Ref, when you speak next, speak uh, closer to the mic. Sure. It's easier for people. Um, here. <laughs> I know. I, well, that, I guess that's a good good sign. Um, let me just ask one more question for me, and I'm going to start moving to questions from the uh, audience. Um, you know, one of the concerns also for this community and many communities in uh, LAUSD is the uh, high rates of suspension and expulsion uh, for boys of color in particular, which uh, the last superintendent. Uh, was seeking to address by raising the data and making some progress on this. Uh, what do you think is the challenge and what are we gonna need to do to have a full implementation of a school climate bill of rights and school-wide positive behavior supports? Start again with Ref. So this is an area that I think the district has, at least from a policy standpoint, really taken on. And I'm really proud of that fact because it's kids who look like me who end up getting suspended more than, than others. And kids who come from communities like these ones that get suspended more than any others. Um, and so that's, a, but I also believe that that policy is not being implemented as aggressively as it can be. And that means that we've got to make sure that our schools are, are safe places where the climate is such a way where kids feel engaged and feel a part of the larger community. It also means we've got to make sure that our teachers and our staff are trained in proper ways of engaging with families to make sure that we're all being preventative around uh, student discipline behavior. It means looking at alternatives to suspension uh, because keeping, keeping a kid at home doesn't help anybody. Certainly not the family, not the kid. It might help the school, but that's not what we're in business for. We're here to help kids and families. Last thing I'll say is that it's really critical to get the community engaged around this. It takes a village, as, as cliche as it sounds, but it really does. We all have to fight to ensure that our kids are getting the best education. Uh, Andrew, same uh, question about this uh, very high and worrisome rates of expulsion and suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I agree with Ref. The, the good news is that the suspension rates have come down in the district. Uh, the problem is what's happening to the kids who aren't being suspended, whether, whether good things are happening to them in the schools. So for, for those of you who don't know, we've, we've launched a new program in LAUSD called Restorative Justice. It's very, the UCLA is behind it, the district is behind it, I'm not sure all the school board is behind it, but um, it's, it's a very positive move and uh, the challenge will be moving it forward. What restorative justice is, is instead of, uh, instead of suspending kids, if they've done something wrong in the school, then they're actually, there's a whole process of conflict resolution and trying to correct the wrong that happened that brings the parents into it too. The challenge we're gonna have is it's nice to say that we have a restorative justice program. It's very important to make sure that it moves forward in all of our schools. It takes resources, it takes commitment, and I will be committed on, a, on, the, on the school board uh, for restorative justice. I also support something called the National um, uh, climate standards, school climate and, standards. I'm sorry, you're going to have to close. Um, thanks for respecting the time limits. Uh, boy, it's great when you go to the community. You get, like, much better questions than I ever thought of. Uh, so let me bring uh, one of them up uh, that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, this is a part of the L.A. Unified School District, these cities that feel ignored. Uh, that is all the actions happening in the city of LA, but these are part of the district. Uh, what would you do and what would you commit to to making sure that this part of the district is actually fully represented in decision making? Andrew, you were the last to go. Well, it, it is part of the district. The, the schools, again, it's my focus on, on individual schools. Um, all, of the, all of the schools in, in Southeast LA and these cities uh, need the exact same attention that, that other schools get. Uh, um, I, 
the, the, lack, the lack of, uh, of enfranchisement may be partially because it's not part of Los Angeles, but the school district is a, is a separate entity. It shouldn't identify itself with Los Angeles. And um, we, you know, we need to treat Jefferson the same as we treat um, Eagle Rock. And we need to treat uh, you know, Bell the same as we treat Franklin and Wilson. So it's, it's, all, it's, it's all part of the district. And I, you know, I intend to be just as committed to these schools as I would be to any other school. Uh, Ref, the issue of these uh, communities sometimes feeling ignored in the bigger political picture. I, what a shame that we've got someone in office right now who doesn't even know where the Southeast cities are, let alone um, know what issues we're really dealing with here. So to me, it's not about giving them the same attention, it's about giving them more attention because they've been neglected for so long. Mm -hmm. I walk into these schools, they look like jails. I walk into these schools and they need modernization now. Kids can't drink water from the faucets in these schools. This is second class citizens here, um, and we need to pay a lot of attention. I've committed that I will put an office in the Southeast cities. The first time that it'll happen, we'll actually have regional offices for school board members because I need to be where the people are, and people need to have access to me. And we need to make sure the work is here, and this will be a shining place and example for the entire rest of the district. 10% of the kids in the entire district are in the southeast cities. That is no joke and nothing to be um, looked upon as, as ignored. We are a force and we have to stick together and we've got to move this forward. Uh, great. Um, another question from the floor, uh, which I appreciate it because I have a son who's a musician and a daughter who's a dancer. Uh, what would you do to ensure that all students have access to the arts? Starting with Ref. That's a critical thing for me because the arts are an important part of education. It opens up our young people's minds, left brain, right brain, all of those things that we know research says is, is not only healthy but advantageous to our, for our young people. Uh, and so it's something that I want to fully fund. I want, I'm committed to that. It's something that I've done in all of our schools. They are part of the core curriculum. Uh, and so we've got to give our young people access the, to all to the arts. The other thing is it can't be either or. So that isn't about like, so now we've got tough times, so we're gonna cut the arts. Who does that? Well, you know, we know who does that. Um, it's, right, it's, it's, we're committed, and so we've gotta make things work. It can't be either or. Our kids deserve a holistic approach to instruction, and the arts are a really important part of that. Uh, Andrew, this question of the arts in schools. Yeah, I, the, the real issue is that there are plenty of kids, too many kids in our high schools, who don't feel connected enough to the academic classes to graduate. And, but they do feel connected to the band or the jazz orchestra or something that, or the, or the musical theater uh, that is happening at their high school and, and, and where the teacher really connects to them as a human being and it's the first time that they really feel included in a group. And that's what the art does, the arts do for the people in our high schools. It keeps them in the school. So it's not an issue of, it's not an issue of whether it's academic or arty. It's an issue of keeping the kids in the schools, keeping them committed. In this area, the biggest issue is attendance. And arts are the answer to that problem. And the second biggest issue after attendance is graduation. And arts are the answer for a big subsection of our kids. And so arts are not an option. Arts have to be a major part of the solution. Um, so we'll start with uh, Andrew on this one. Uh, Ten years ago, the Los Angeles Unified School District passed the A through G resolution, uh, something that at least created the opportunity uh, for students in every school to acquire what they needed to be able to go to the university. How's it working? What else needs to be done? Well, although it was adopted ten years ago, it's really just kicking in now. I think, in fact, my, my son who graduates next year is not fully A through G. I think it will only be my daughter. So one thing is if we're going to have a, an, uh, an initiative like that, we should take less than 10 years to, to roll it out. <laughs> but uh, um, the reason for A through G, G is the idea that every kid deserves college. And it's something I strongly believe in because 10 years ago, we really did have a belief in this district that some kids didn't deserve college, that college was not for them, and we made that decision for them ahead of time. And so this is an initiative to say, everyone can go to college, and the way you go to college, you know, the California state system says, if you have these requirements, then you can go 
and you get a C or better, then you can go to one of our, our colleges. It's a great civil rights and social justice initiative. However, it does leave some kids out. So moving forward, we're going to really have to look at those kids who struggle, quite frankly, to get Ds. We've, we've outlawed Ds in this district, and I think that's going to be a, a big issue for a bunch of kids. We still need to graduate kids, even in the A through G system. Oh, Rev. Yeah, it's... Um you know, the interesting thing about this is that UCLA did a study that talked about LAUSD's implementation and made recommendations that were common sense. Prepare teachers better to ensure that our kids get the supports, put more supports in schools, and the district has done nothing around that. And so to me, this implementation of A through G is a false policy, a false hope, because what we're really doing is setting our kids up for failure. Without having the resources tied to A through G implementation and without ensuring that our teachers are qualified, can support our kids, and that there are other systems of support to get them through it, it doesn't matter. And that's what we're seeing right now is that there's a big bubble of kids that are not meeting the A through G, and so we're actually making, doing more damage than, than good. Um, I believe that we've got, it's pretty easy. It's supporting teachers, giving them the right resources, the right training, the right tools, and then putting intervention systems in the school to get our kids up. Um, I'm gonna shift now to a couple of different groups of students um, about which there are special concerns. Uh, one question that came up from the floor is in particular about special ed students and the way in which people get stuck and never really reclassified. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts about special ed in the district? Rev. One of the things that we know is that special education is just continuing to be, uh, there's more students that are qualifying for uh, special needs and, and what we've gotta do is create a system that gives every kid an individualized, not only gives them an individualized education plan, but actually fulfills what that plan says. And right now, we don't have the proper resources allocated in the district to ensure that that happens. It goes back to training. It goes back with working with our higher education partners to ensure that the teachers who are in our special education programs are high quality and qualified. And it also is about engaging families. Here's the thing that I know to be true. I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a little bit more than the 30 seconds left. Um, the district does a really awful job about educating our families what rights they have to ensure that their kids get what they need in special education. In fact, I hear more and more about families that are not, that the district not following the law when the families request assessments for special education, and that's gotta stop. That's a civil rights issue, it's our kids deserve it, and we need to make sure that our families are, uh, are educated and that we're open to serving those kids. Uh, yeah. Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts on uh, special ed its challenges and what you need to do to improve it in the district. Yeah, ch special ed in, in and of itself, by definition, is challenging because the special needs kids are, are, have special needs and there's a big uh, uh, breadth of special needs in our district. There are, are people, young people who are not ambulatory, uh, who, who are not, uh, who don't speak, and then there, there are people who are on the autism spectrum. There are many, many different issues. And so it, it's, an, it's an issue of resources, and each of those kids needs to have an individual education plan. And the biggest thing that's happened in the district over the last, let's say, five to six years is that assistant principals have been uh, removed from our schools, and putting assistant principals back, especially in our elementary school, uh, is, allows each child to have an individual uh, education plan, and, and it allows somebody to actually do that plan. So it's, it's really a matter of more administrators in the schools that also will free up the principal to pay attention to instruction in the classroom. So that would be a major priority of me for, for me, is to bring back assistant principals and clerical staff in offices. It would, it would make a big difference in schools. Um, so I'm gonna do the, uh, give you an extra 30 seconds, and then I'll give you a minute. How do you pay for it? Well, it's a matter, it's a matter of prioritizing it. Um, luckily, there's a, there's a lot more money coming into the school system now. Um, I, I'm proposing a, a system of budgeting, which is gonna be a major responsibility of the school board, called outcomes-based budgeting, which actually looks at, right, right now, with the way the budget works, is that you have a bunch of programs that have already been paid for, that were paid for last year, and they're just paid for again, moving forward. And, and if they're connected to the outcomes we want, it's sort of theoretical the way they're connected. But if we actually look at the outcome we want, like better treatment for special needs kids, and then figure out what the obstacles are, and then we can find the programs that actually 
fit that, that need and actually accomplish that goal rather than paying for other things that are tangential. Um, Ref, uh, so you've had some suggestions too about different things that would require more resources in particular directions. How do you pay for it? First and foremost, the central office needs to be lean and it needs to be a service provider to the schools so that more dollars flow down to the schools. Uh, and that's a critical piece around that. The other thing is we have examples of SELPAs up and down the state that are efficient, that act, meet the needs of their kids. And the LA Unified has, because they're the biggest district in the state, second largest in the country, they just think that they don't have to learn from anybody. And, that, and they, they're very insular, as opposed to going out and understanding what mm -hmm. are the best practices mm -hmm. out there. The sole issue of the El Dorado Selpa and Aspire comes back to me again. The El Dorado Selpa is managing their resources properly. It has enough money to, to pay for the, the, the students. Great, and I'm going to cut you there because no. it was 30, 30. I oh, think sorry, it didn't. wasn't a, yeah, a new question? No, yeah, I I'm going to ask you a new, a new question. question <laughs> uh, so uh, another, I should, I'll go back to the other question. But this one just made me think of a rewording of a question that came my way. Um, who is the district not partnering with that it should in order to meet the needs of children? Start with Ref. I go back to the thing, the district is a closed system. It doesn't want to partner with anybody. In fact, you've got to sort of knock the doors down to want to get in and partner with the school district. There's so many community resources, uh, CBOs, to provide wraparound services for our kids. There are arts institutions. The city is full of, of cultural institutions that want to partner with the district, but they don't know how, or they don't feel that the district is, wants to partner. And so that's a big piece of what uh, I believe we should do, is make sure that we open up our schools and our systems, and that the partnerships happen at the local level as well as the district systems level. So there are assets here in the southeast cities that need to be leveraged and those community partnerships happen, one school, one organization at a time, but there's also system level. The other thing that I want to make sure is we don't have great partnerships with our business community and yet we are producing human capital for our economy and that is a place we've got to push both the district but also the business community. Great. Uh, Andrew, same question. What go. partnerships uh, is LAUSD not doing oh my gosh. that would be useful? And, and I, I, I have a similar answer, which is which, which ones are they doing? Right. <laughs> the, uh, the, the district is famous for not wanting to partner. Several years ago, I walked in to a research meeting in the district, and they said, and it, we were a bunch of, uh, of academics from UCLA and USC sitting there, and they said, we know how to do better research better than you do. We know more about data than you do. So uh, th they just have a feeling that they know how to do everything. So first of all, we need to put an end to that. There are so many great resources in LA. And as Ref said, schools are doing partners, par partnerships right now. Um, like Washington Prep, a school that I've worked with a little bit, is partnering, doing a great job of, of partnering with the community. But I'll say very specifically, there are two partnerships that I'm very excited about, which is uh, the Los Angeles Educational Research uh, Initiative, which, which partners UCLA, USC, and Northridge with uh, LAUSD. And LAUSD has been against that, but I would be for it. And then I'm also very excited about partnering with uh, community groups around some of the money that's coming from the state uh, associated with the cap and trade bill. Um, there's going to be a lot of great partnership opportunities for greening our schools and creating um, sustainable communities. Um, so let's uh, uh, move to yet another topic very relevant to this area. And if there are more cards that have been collected, please bring them forward. Um, is support for uh, English learners. Uh, this is something uh, dear to uh, my heart. Uh, in part because of my own experience, but because my wife actually was a bilingual teacher in East LA uh, at uh, Euclid Avenue Elementary. Uh, she's now a district administrator at Lawndale uh, Unified School District. Uh, how are we doing? What do we need to do better to meet the needs of ESL English uh, learners? And uh, we'll start with Andrew. Uh, yeah, we are doing some some good things. Uh, it, it turns out that the kids who do so so what happens now is that kids get get tested early on uh, in their schooling career, uh, and they're asked whether or not somebody in their home speaks another language besides English. And if they do, then they get put into this system where they're learning, uh, they're, they're considered English language learners. So the first thing is we have to make sure that they actually are English language learners. We're classifying them that way too much. And then we have to make sure that they're reclassified as proficient in English uh, 
as early as possible, fourth or fifth grade is what I would prefer, so that they can join the regular population before that. Most of the kids who aren't reclassified by fourth or fifth grade become long-term ELs, and that's an, a big problem for the district, and we don't do very well with the long-term English language learners. I'm also a big proponent of dual language immersion programs, which are often thought of as programs for non-Spanish speakers to learn Spanish, but actually research shows that dual language immersion really benefits Spanish speakers uh, as much if not more than non-Spanish non speakers, or I say Spanish, but whatever the language that they're being immersed in is. So I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, Ref, your thoughts on the ESL programs? Yeah, I think it goes right back down to, as Andrew said, the identification of students and the proper identification. And as they're moving through the system, ensuring that their language proficiency is, is target, that, we're, that we understand what the language proficiency is and that we have targeted instruction around that. What that will take is, great teachers, ensuring that our teachers are prepared and that they're serving the kids well and they know how to differentiate instruction. And that's critical. We don't support our teachers enough around English language learners. The other piece is you're always an English language learner. I am still an English language learner. And so even when you get reclassified, what happens there is like, oh, you're no longer an EL, therefore the services stop. And the truth is no. Uh, it, it takes a different type of service. And so we need to make sure that our schools and our teachers are able to serve the students as they go through that whole spectrum of learning English uh, as a second language. The last thing I'll say is that language development is critical and there's so much that we can work with our families around language development because speaking to your kids and speaking with them in your native language is a powerful tool for literacy, period. Great. Um, so again, starting with uh, REF, uh, similar but not exactly the same. Um, what steps would you take to ensure, this came from the audience, that undocumented students understand and take advantage of the opportunities that have been created recently with AB 540, the California Dream App, uh, DACA, et cetera? What would you do and have the district do, REF? Yeah, it's, it's really... We're an educational institution. What that means is our obligation to educate not only the young people in our classrooms, but our communities as well. That's where we can work with our community partners to ensure that our families and our young people are, are learning what resources they have and what rights they have as uh, individuals who, who are in this country. We don't do enough of that. In fact, we do the opposite. We shame individuals into believing that they don't have a right to access, as opposed to embracing and saying, this is your right, you are able to do these things. And that takes a paradigm shift. It really takes the institution to say, every individual child is worthy. And our job is to ensure that they are lifted to their potential. And people don't think that in this district. They see a, a kid and there's some percentage, some dollar amount, they don't see the humanity, the human behind, behind the numbers, right? And we've gotta get back to that. A system this large can look at every single kid as an individual and serve them well. I believe that fully. Great. Andrew? No, that's, that's great. Uh, really, the only thing I'd have to, to add to that is the, the importance of community outreach. Uh, and, and it starts with, with teacher education. So we need to have professional development for our teachers to educate them about the new provisions in the DREAM Act. And then we need to do community events. And it's, to my knowledge, LAUSD has not done any community events around that now. Um, and the community events should be, should be based at the schools. The school um, site administrators should be empowered and prepared to do those things. And um, teachers need to go out actually into the community and they need to visit their students' families. And they need to, you know, they need to do home visits in order to explain these, these, uh, these new provisions. And it's, 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 there's nothing more important for a large group of our students to know that they now have the possibility of going to college and they don't need to, to, to give themselves short shrift and, and to have uh, you know, smaller dreams than, the, than they would have otherwise. Let me ask you a related question, 30 second answer from each of you. Uh, the executive action by President Obama is uh, creating an opportunity not just for DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Adjustments, but DAPA, Deferred Action for Parents. Uh, who are the parents of U.S. born, generally, uh, children. What can the district do to help inform uh, parents about these opportunities? Andrew, 30 seconds, Rev, 30 seconds. Again, it's, the, it's, it's part of the whole plan. It's a big priority of mine, and, and I, I hear about it all the time on the, on the Parent Advisory Committee. 
the district has to do a much better job of including parents as partners, I mean, as genuine partners. We hear that phrase, but parents need to be given power over their, over their school sites, and they need to be brought in uh, to all kinds of decision making. And, and as they're brought in, then, you know, we need to have, we, at Marshall High, we're creating something called a hub, because the, the idea of a parent center it has, it, is so cheapened by the way that we've run it in this district. We need to bring parents in and then, and then you have the opportunity to educate them about these things. Ref, your 30 seconds on this? I don't like the 30 second questions. Okay. Because <laughs> they're a minute and a half answer. Um, so very briefly, um, it's, it's important that the district work with families, open up our schools, work with partners to educate our families. But it's about an understanding about what is at the forefront of our parents' minds. You can't criticize parents for not being engaged when we don't engage them. Mm -hmm. You can't criticize parents for not doing X, Y, Z when what's, what's on their mind is the issue of immigration and being here legally mm -hmm. or illegally, right? And so by engaging with families and really having dialogue and communication, you can get through these things. We're not an institution. We are here to develop human beings, and that means our young people but their parents as well. You did very well for 30 seconds, so it's, the rule the rule is okay for you. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple more questions as we drive this to a close. One that came in from uh, the audience too is starting with Ref. How would you best support LGBT students in our schools? So I'm the first candidate uh, running openly as a gay man, um, and my family is um, supportive and loves me deeply. And, and we need to make sure that our young people know that they're families and that they're supported deeply. And I've been going to schools now talking to young people who are in LGBTQ, LGBT, LGBTQ. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, we're yeah, going to add, just added the Q. We're, we're yeah. going to add another letter soon. So <laughs> go ahead, yeah, so. And talking to them about what it means to, to be running in this race and being a role model. But they're really the role models to me. They're so brave. And so it's, it's really important that we expand those. But I will say one thing. I've heard that at, at a particular school in the Southeast cities, we have administration that's not supportive mm. of this group. And I'm actually going there next week to make some trouble as a community member mm. around that. Andrew, how do we best support our LGBT students in our school district? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's hard. In, that's terrible if it's true there's a school that's, that's doing that. I mean, the most important thing is that the, the adults are, are supportive in the schools. I mean, for these kids, the, the most basic issue is admitting to their families uh, their own sexuality. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's on top of the struggles that they go through as 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds anyway. So it's, it's, it's an enormous, uh, um, psychological burden that these kids are under and we, we need to know I don't want to call it a burden that's not quite right it's a, it's a struggle that they're going through and 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 not having support at their school is the last thing they need because what they're really worried about is not having support at home until they come out and so in the school we can create that nurturing environment that loving environment that says that every every everybody is okay here that everybody is welcome and you know as an as educators I think I when we see kids who are going through that, learning that growing process, it's just incumbent on us to, to give them that support. So I'm going to uh, start driving this to a close. At the end, you'll have uh, two minutes each. Uh, we'll be ending at about 7.45. This session is scheduled till 8. That'll give you time, the audience, to ask one-on-one -on -one questions, not in this forum, but afterwards the candidates will come down and can, you can come and ask them individual uh, questions express individual concerns. Uh, so that's where we're headed for the next 10 minutes. Uh, but I want to ask a, a couple of questions that might give us a bit of a sense of who you are. Uh, Andrew just went, oh. Uh, so, uh, so first question, uh, what's been your favorite moment on the campaign trail? Now, of course, the right answer is this forum. but. Uh, Aside from this forum tonight, what's been your favorite moment, maybe your biggest learning on the campaign trail? And Andrew, yeah, mm. you're up first. Yeah, these questions, like, <laughs> to think of the one, the one moment are, the, are hard questions for me, but it's, it's been a, such a personal growth experience, and I, I think the amazing thing for me is, um, in addition to right now, 
which is a great moment, um, is, is the, uh, uh, the way my family has come together around all of this and how I, I've always been a very, a dad who's, who's always been around. You know, I was coaching my kids' uh, sports teams and shopping and doing dishes and cooking and, and laundry and everything, and I've done none of that for the last uh, <laughs> uh, uh, four months. And my kids have just really risen to the challenge. They're, they're teenagers now, but to see them, uh, you know, do the shopping, not only the shopping, but, but uh, they, they, just, they make the shopping list and decide what to, what to buy and, and are taking care of the house. It's not the, the neatest house in the, <laughs> in the district right now, but uh, to, the, the way that people come together, and, and, and not only our family, but with, um, well, I'll use the word adversary, com competitors yeah. coming together. And, you know, the reason we're in this is because as educators, even though we disagree sometimes in these uh, debates and these sort of in these elections, we're really all coming at it from the same place, which is that we want to see kids do better and we believe that everyone can learn. And no matter what side we're on, we, we all believe that deep down. So we have that in common. And that's a, a great spiritual experience that we're having. Great. And uh, thanks. And I think our uh, timekeeper uh, has interpreted that as a two-minute thing. So, uh, Andrew, you spoke for about a minute and a half. We'll do the same for a ref. What's uh, your favorite moment on the campaign trail or your, your biggest learning from doing this run? It's the favorite moment is going to happen soon. Uh, my mother has been a resident of the United States for more than 40 years. She recently became a citizen. She will vote for the first time, and she will vote for her son. She'll be voting for me. It, it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. But the other thing is whenever I feel down, there's a list of, of callers that we've connected with. I call them my grandmas. And so if I feel down and I've got 20 minutes to spare, I call one of them. And I just say, this is Ralph Rodriguez. And estoy rezando por ti. Vas a ganar. So they lift my spirits up. Um, I don't have uh, my grandmother on my mother's side, and, on my father's side, sorry. And, um, and it's been great to connect with these, these individuals. So it's the people. This is, I do that part again, over again. Mm. I wouldn't want to fundraise, but I'd want to do with the people. <laughs> That's great news. So we've learned something important about these candidates, which is that Andrew can do housework quite well. Uh, uh, and that uh, Ref can uh, call together a group of abuelitas That's to right. <laughs> uh, provide him serious advice. Um, I want to uh, give each of you now two minutes uh, to make a closing statement, or if there's a question I should have asked and didn't, uh, you can kind of uh, tap into that as well. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I think, Andrew, you started. Yes. So good, the timing worked out perfectly. So Ref. Um, you get two minutes to close us, and Andrew, and then I'll say a word to close this session. Thanks. So it's, it, it excites me to see this many people engage civically and wanting to come out and, and learn from us and what we're about. I will tell you this much. This election will be decided by the Southeast cities. You need to vote. Our young people need to vote. We can't keep complaining that the Southeast cities are ignored and then not bother voting. It is your constitutional right. My mother's waited over 40 years to do it. You need to vote, and you need to get young people to vote. We will win this race when we get active and exercise our vote and our right. And so I'm really optimistic about what's going to happen here in the Southeast cities and about the learning that we have in the Northeast to bring down to the Southeast. But I know that what we're really going to prove is that the Latino vote matters and that you're going to be the ones that are part of that. So I thank you for your time today, and I ask you to make an informed choice, but more importantly, vote. Thank you, Andrew. You're, you're, uh, you're two minutes and no, no uh, interaction with the audience. I announced that earlier. Uh, I'll second that. Andrew. I'll second that. I, I'll just I'll, I'll do something a little different. Uh, we've talked a lot about what's wrong with the district or very specific policies. I, I just want to talk about how 
I would be different on the school board and how I would solve some of the problems that we have been having that, you know, that, that, that you feel with your kids when they come home every day or when it, it's doubtful whether they'll graduate or whether it's unclear whether they have enough credits or they're not engaged. Uh, I'm going to do things on the school board to help you with your kids to get them through school, to graduate, and to go on to college or career. And uh, what you need for that to happen is a way to communicate with your school board member. And that's going to be my first priority, is having liaison officers in all the schools so that I can communicate with the parents. Not I communicate with the parents, but the the parents communicate with me so that I can do what they need to help their kids graduate. That's going to be priority number one. You also need assurances that the school board is making the right decisions. So I'm the person on the school board who can ask the hard questions, who knows the questions to ask, and who can make sure that your money is spent well. So that's very important. We also need, and here we agree, a school board that tunes in, shows up, and listens. But in particular, we need somebody who shows up for us for the community, for the parents, and for the schools. And we haven't had that, and it's really time that we get that. Um, and we need a school board that supports the schools, not controls the schools. I'm all about supporting the teachers and supporting the families and not controlling them. So you have a clear choice in this election. You can go with the status quo, with the way it's been done before. You can go with choices that are supported by big outside interests. Or you can go with somebody who actually comes directly from the community, who's a parent, who's embedded in the community, who's active in the community, and who gets all of his support from parents like you and families like you. I don't get support from anywhere else. And so if, if you think that local control that focuses on the quality of schools and feels the quality of schools is the way to make change, then I'm your candidate. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So I want to do a couple of things. One is uh, to thank the candidates, give both of them a big round of applause for showing up. As I mentioned, it's a brave and I'm sure tiring thing to do this. Uh, and uh, that level of dedication from both of you is uh, worthy of admiration uh, by community members, whatever choice they make about which of you or the other candidate is the one that they decide to vote for. The other thing is that I'd like to make sure that we give a big round of applause for someone who was not uh, heralded in this process but has been actually absolutely critical. That's the timekeeper. Yes. <laughs> and it is through the dint of his effort and the uh, preciseness of our candidates they were able to bring this forum to a close right now uh, on time. We said we'd end at about 7.45. And for the next 15 minutes, we'll ask you to come off the stage when I come off too, and you can come up and ask them uh, individual questions. Again, let's thank the United Way and all of the partners for putting this together. And thank you, Manuel. And Manuel. thank you, and most of all, a big clap for the community for being this engaged. <laughs> HP in the house. OK, so uh, the candidates will come off now. Everybody, thank you very much for your evening.